Hi, everybody. Good evening and welcome to Shoals Marine Laboratory's weekly marine seminar series. I am Dr. Jennifer Seavey, the executive director at Shoals. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, we are the largest and oldest undergraduate focused marine lab in the country. And we are jointly operated by the University of New Hampshire and Cornell. We are located in the Isles of Shoals, about 10 miles offshore of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And every summer we host these rock talks that we call them that in, in honor of our rocky campus. And on a typical year, we host them on the island, but this is not a typical year. And so we are bringing them to you online. And we're really excited to have you all with us tonight. So our format is a 45 minute talk followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. Please use the question and answer box that's down at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. And if you have any technical problems too, please use that box and we'll monitor that and get help you out. Um, I do wanna warn you right up, Brian is having some challenges with his internet. So um, he's actually um, gonna say hello at the beginning, but then he'll go off video because we found that was working better for his talk. So please be patient, we, we are working on that. Um, so Brian Silliman is the Rachel Carlson, which of course we all love here in Maine, especially Rachel Carlson. The Rachel Carlson Distinguished Professor of Marine Conservation Biology at Duke's Nicholas School for the Environment. His teaching and research are focused on community ecology, conservation and restoration, global change, plant animal interactions, evolution and ecological consequences of cooperative behavior. Brian has published uh, 21 book chapters, more than 150 peer reviewed journal articles, co-edited four books. He's got an undergrad and a master's degree from the University of Virginia. And he has a PhD from Brown. And I, of course, have a very special place in my heart for Dr. Silliman, because he gave me my first job uh, helping him run a marine lab at the University of Florida. So I wouldn't be in this position if he hadn't helped me out back then. And uh, we had a great time running that lab. Uh, he is talking to us today. His talk is called Sea Rescue, Marine Species Partnerships, Restoring Our Coastal Ecosystems. So Brian, you wanna say a quick hello and then go to your talk. All right, so thank you so much for this invitation. I'll say hello to everybody with the video here and then turn that off in a second. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. CV, Jen, it's great to see you. Um, I would say that you were the, the director of the Marine Lab and I was helping you out, uh, University of Florida, and we were uh, both learning together. It was, it was a great time. And we also did some restoration work together and it was, uh, it, during that time that uh, a lot of the inspiration for the ideas in this talk were, were generated. And I look forward to getting up there sometime soon. Um, so let me turn off my video and there we go. Okay, so let's get started here. Um, today I wanna to talk to you about a proposed paradigm shift in the way that we approach not only restoring marine ecosystems, but marine conservation. It's not a paradigm change, I'm not, saying that we should reject what we've done before, but I think we should expand it greatly uh, and incorporate uh, in a systematic way, positive species interactions um, in all that we do for restoration and conservation. And today I'll focus on restoration. Um, it's a positive talk. I just have a little bit about doom and gloom to say that we all know that marine systems are in trouble. 30 to 90% of marine ecosystems um, uh, have declined, uh, there's been a 30 to 90% decline in habitat coverage of marine ecosystems. For instance, oysters are down about 90% globally. Um, we've invested billion dollars, billions of dollars trying to conserve them, um, but we've just slowed the decline. How do we reverse that? Um, we have to do some, we have to change and we have to be, innovate and, and, and do groundbreaking work like we've done with other great um, human endeavors like agriculture. And one of those is restoration. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about how we can um, use positive species interactions to change the trajectory of restoration. The three main uh, take home lessons from this talk are that positive species interactions are exceedingly common in nature. They're incredibly powerful. 
uh, two, they're, they're, they're very important and especially so during an ecosystem's recovery after disturbance. And then if we incorporate those into the design of restoration by changing our planting, by changing where we plant next to predators, for example, we can greatly change uh, the success of these restoration systems. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to start off with a story. Uh, I got this idea um, first when I was uh, in graduate school, when I went to Chile with my advisor, we were doing a basic ecological study. We flew down to the coast, uh, Santiago, went, drove two hours to the coast, and we were asking a basic ecological question. We wanted to know how the um, type of interaction between neighbors changed across stress. And we predicted that in the, um, when neighbors are present, they're likely to compete um, when it's a non-stressful situation. But during stressful situations, when you have a neighbor next to you, you're more likely to cooperate. So what we did is we planted marsh plants with and without neighbors across a intertidal gradient from the low intertidal, which is pretty stressful for plants because they're inundated and don't have oxygen and are hit by waves, to the high intertidal. So we set it up and we had colleagues there and we flew back to the US and we got the distress call um, probably three months later, we, and they said, uh, we have a big problem. Um, we had a tsunami and there was a massive overwash and we think we've lost the experiment. You guys want to fly down here and let's check it out. So next slide, please. What we found was that there was, uh, there was differential survivorship. There was a little bit, but the only treatments that survived were those um, treatments in which plants were planted next to their neighbors uh, down low and even up high. All those that were solitary died, and the ones that were clumped together survived and continued to grow. And this suggested to me, this was kind of a eureka moment. I, it, it certainly supported the hypothesis that we have an ecology that with increasing stress, uh, interactions between neighbors would shift from negative to positive. But this was about recovery and ecosystem. It had been covered in sand like a carpet. And the only ones to survive were the ones working together. So um, from my understanding of conservation, this didn't seem to be the way we were planting ecosystems that is with neighbors, we usually spread them out. What would happen if we change that? So uh, next slide, please. To think about positive interactions in the context of the marine conservation and restoration paradigm, we first have to understand what that paradigm is and where it came from. And uh, if you look in the, uh, the science and the history books, it really came from um, forestry science in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Silviculture has been going on for thousands of years and we have, have uh, as humans have really nailed how to grow trees. And you can see that they're spaced apart to minimize competition, but to maximize productivity per unit area of land. Um, and what we did is we took this technology and just dipped it into the ocean. We just got it wet. And when we would plant ecosystems, uh, we would use the idea that we need to avoid competition to maximize productivity. Next slide, please. And if you expand this and really sort of list out what the paradigm um, of marine restoration is, the first thing that we sit down and talk about is that if we want an ecosystem to grow back, the first thing we have to reduce the physical stressors that led to its demise. You want a river to come back, you have to reduce nutrients and toxins. If you want salt marsh stress to come back, you may have to, salt marshes to come back, you might have to uh, get rid of the dam, for instance. We also have to reduce human impacts via protected areas and management. So you hear this again and again, we, we need protected areas more and more, but that's, that's what we've been doing uh, and we're trying to do more. And the third thing is we need to suppress any biological negative interactions like invasive species. And if you put all these together, what people do at the planning table conservationists and scientists is we systematically identify and avoid negative interactions. So if you want to target a conservation target, think about, for instance, with your own human health, how do you improve your human health? You reduce stressors. But there's also other ways to do that. And we can actually uh, think about increasing or decreasing stress by increasing positive interactions. Um, the next slide. So if you take the marine restoration paradigm and you overlay it on uh, how we try to restore coastal wetlands. You can see here, this is a mangrove restoration site and that it's planted very similarly to the way we plant pine plantations. Uh, all these plants are spaced out. They're not allowed to interact for the fear that they would compete with each other and would reduce their success. 
notice how small these plants are at the water's edge. Um, they are being bombarded by waves and uh, ox low oxygen stress right there, not doing well. And the ones up in the high inner tidal uh, near the road are doing better. But we know that positive interactions are incredibly abundant in marine ecosystems, in terrestrial ecosystems. Next slide, please. One of the best examples we have here on the coast of North Carolina is this cross ecosystem interaction between oysters and salt marsh grasses. Now oysters uh, of the 20,000 species of bivalves is one of the only ones in the world that can live out of the mud. It's an amazing animal. Uh, they live cooperatively in large groups. They're very sharp. They, they, these groups protect them from predators um, and they do better um, in groups when they deal with the uh, drying out stress. And they're engineers. They build sediment two or three inches a year and they move out ocean uh, seaward as, as they develop over time because they're building land and they move into the water. And following behind them as they engineer the shoreline are salt marshes. And salt marshes need the oysters as a wave baffle. Without their dampening of the waves, the salt marsh roots would be pulled up and thrown apart. So oysters facilitate the existence and expansion of salt marshes in, in many, many ecosystems. Uh, next slide. And so if you were to look at um, a conceptual idea of all the different types of positive species interactions that occur, could occur, um, we have direct ones, we have facilitations. Um, that's one way where A could facilitate B. Um, a species C could facilitate multiple species D, E, F. And of course, if there is a facilitation one way, there can be a feedback. And once we have a feedback, that's called a mutualism. So A facilitates B. And if B also positively affects A, then we have a mutualism. Um, importantly, there are indirect positive interactions and these are very powerful, but sometimes hard to decipher and see in nature because it involves um, three species and indirect mechanisms. So for instance, um, two negative interactions we know make a positive. So A could suppress B, B could suppress C, but because of that, C benefits from A. Um, and there also could be double positive interactions, A, B, C, all positively interacting with each other. Next slide, please. So what I would like to do now is talk to you about examples from our research that shows how each one of those types of positive ecological species interactions is common in coastal wetlands in which we study. And they're incredibly important for the recovery and stability of those ecosystems. And once we have those examples, then um, we can start to begin to make the case that they're likely important in the restoration for, uh, of marine ecosystems. So here's an example of facilitation of population, one-way interactions. There are three species in this Argentine salt marsh. Um, we see there's a succulent plant, the tall plant is a Spartina plant, and then this uh, herbivorous crab, so super abundant, that comes out at night and nibbles on the taller plant. And what we found was that the taller plant, when it's recovering in these disturbed habitats where there's no vegetation, actually does better in the presence of the other plant, which is a succulent. And the mechanism is, is that the crab has a hard time getting to its favorite food, the taller plant. It can't move through the succulent as well. And it also doesn't like to eat the succulent. So sometimes it'll just void the other area. So here's a one-way facilitation. If you want this ecosystem to recover and the tall plant to be back there, you actually have to plant the other species first to protect it from herbivory. Next slide, please. Uh, another example of facilitation that's really important comes to us from Argentina as well. This is work we did about eight or nine years ago. And here we saw that the entire ecosystem was dependent on facilitation by mussels. And the context that this is what's done in the Rocky Intertidal. And biodiversity in the Rocky Intertidal is thought to be driven by an important species interaction called keystone predation. And this was founded by Bob Payne in the 1960s off the coast of Washington. And he found by removing these pink and purple and orange sea stars that um, biodiversity went down because mussels expanded. The mussels are the favorite food of the sea stars. And in the absence of sea stars, mussels, which happened to be the bully and the competitive dominant, move down and they crowd out all these other species that would love to be in the rocky intertidal too. If you put the sea stars back, they eat the mussels. They don't like to eat the algae. They don't like to eat um, 
all the sponges. And so sponges and algae and a diversity of, of community comes back. So keystone predation was thought to be the most important species interactions for controlling diversity in the system. We wanted to test whether or not that actually occurred in Argentina. And the difference being that on the coast of Washington, it was more like a wet blanket, very moist, um, rains a lot, uh, not such a high temperature trust. In Argentina, you're down there on a desert and the average wind speed, I'm holding up my jacket there on the coast of Argentina and there's a desert behind me, is around 60 kilometers per hour uh, on average every day. You have to put Vaseline on your face to not dry out. It's, it's a, a really harsh environment. And when we went down there, we were, we were completely surprised. We didn't find any of the biodiversity that we found on rocky shores like in the Isle of Shoals or in Washington, it was a, what you see I'm standing on is a carpet of tiny black mussels, the size of your fingertip. And we couldn't find, there was no barnacles, there's no native barnacle here. When we went down the low inner tidal, nothing, just mussels. So we didn't know what to do. We were gonna look at interactions. We didn't see any other species. So as most good ecologists, we just decided to do disturbance experiments. So we got ice scrapers and started making holes in the mussel beds. Next slide. And what we found, that's where the diversity was. It was, it was a, it was a, menagerie was a giant condominium, a mussel condominium, and all the other species were living in the mussels. And you can see a picture of the sea star below there, and the ruler shows you that that's an adult sea star that maxes out at about two inches. It's called Asterius minimus. And all these other characters that are really big on the Washington coast and Chilean coast and Isle of Shoals are just tiny. Everything, the crabs are one inch long. And um, as we were pulling them out within an hour, they just dried out. They were just dying right there in our hands. And so next slide, we went back um, to the little hotel that we we're staying at four hours from the nearest gas station. And we started to rethink, what are we, what are we seeing? And, and, and what, is the, what is the real interesting question here? So after a, a couple glasses of wine and some um, Milanesa, we asked, uh, we put this together. What is the relative importance of predation, keystone predation, which Bob Payne found, and direct facilitation by mussels and controlling biodiversity? We thought these mussels, instead of suppressing diversity in this system, were actually um, facilitating it and, and, and suppressing wind stress. So to do that, we just, we did a three-year experiment and we put cages out. And there's an example of a cage. And we excluded predators without mussels. We excluded predators with mussels and we did muscle mimics and we had bare areas and we had cage controls. And I'll show you the effect of those treatments on biodiversity in the next slide. So on your x-axis here, you can see these are the treatments. We had bare, so that's just bare rock where we'd scrape away the mussels. We had a bare with cage, we had a cage control that allows predators in, but looks for the artifacts of just having a cage out there. Uh, cage plus shade, let's get rid of the sun stress cage plus rocks, so it's a muscle mimic and cage plus muscles. And on the y-axis, we have species richness, the number of species. And after three years, you can see that in the bear, cage, and cage control, um, the species diversity was really low, on average about three, um, three species in each one of those plots. Um, the black bars signify low intertidal zone and the open bars are high intertidal. But the big effect is what you really, there was a, a big elevation effect. What, what it was was the presence of mussels. After three years, the, the system almost fully recovered in the presence of mussels and the mussel mimic, and really nothing happened without mussels. And we added sponges later on, and we found what's happening is that the mussels retain water in this matrix. There's three or four mussels on top of each other. They secrete bissel threads. It's full of water. And the animals move in between that matrix and they don't dry out. Without the mussels, um, they dry out within a couple hours. So what we found is rather than sea stars maintaining diversity, it switched under high physical stress, positive interactions became more important. Next slide, please. So uh, Bob Payne called me up and he was actually a really important mentor in my career. Um, I had found, and I'll talk about that later on, keystone predation and salt marshes. And, um, he was, a, he's been a great mentor and facilitator in my life, but he said, Bob, I don't, he said, Brian, I don't believe you this time. He said, um, I believed you when you found Keystone predation in salt marshes, but not that you don't find it in Rocky Shores. So what I'm going to do, and Bob was, uh, he's passed away since he's just a great guy. He was, uh, about 80 and, um, he said, um, I want to come down there and see it. 
So we organized a trip and we flew down there and it took 32 hours to get to that field site. And there was a whole caravan of students, graduate students and professors, Marine colleges, three, three buses of people um, going down there just to see Bob in the field um, and experience um, just exploring with him and hearing what he had to say. So we got there and everybody was talking and just gossiping back and forth on Rocky Intertidal. And then Bob had slipped away by himself. And we found him about an hour later. He was, he had got down on his hands and knees. He could barely see with his Coke bottle glasses. So he's on his hands and knees going down to the low Rocky Intertidal and found him down there. And he said, Brian, I guess I believe you now. I just can't find the sea stars. And, um, we had a fun conversation and he said, I want to come back uh, and go further north and further south. We still didn't find the sea stars. They are subtitled either. The large sea stars just can't handle the inner tide. I said, well, this might be the only case where sea stars aren't important on rocky shores. But it was a fun trip uh, to go down there and a great experience. Next slide, please. So there's an example. Those are examples of facilitation one way. And here's some examples of mutualisms, powerful mutualisms. Next slide. And so I'm going to give these examples in the context of the recovery of salt marshes from massive interactions from massive drought and overfishing. And in China, southeastern United States, in Argentina, and now in a little bit in California, what's happening is drought is increasing salt stress in the salt, salt marshes. They're used to having salt, but not so much because there's a lot of evaporation without being dosed by rain in the summer. The plants become more vulnerable to the grazers and the grazers are unleashing themselves in these big brown areas you see in that picture of the marsh are eat out areas where snail fronts and sometimes crab fronts go through and destroy marshes in those areas. So we're interested, how do these ecosystems recover and what species interactions are important? Next slide. Christine Angelina, who was also at University of Florida, who's a professor there now, she was in the lab and she found some really interesting interactions that there were same species mutualisms really important. If you look at recovery in these mudflats, you would find that plants with neighbors grew three times, 300, 200% um, higher growth rate with neighbor than without. And the mechanism is that plants that live in wetlands have to shunt oxygen from their leaves down to their roots. And it's a bit of a messy process. Uh, they do that because it's muddy environment and there's no oxygen down there for them, the roots to, uh, to use in respiration. And so the leaves supply that oxygen, but it's messy, it leaks out the roots. And so if you're next to another plant, you actually can benefit from the leaky oxygen that's there. And so um, that's the mechanism of the positive effect of having a neighbor around. Next slide. There's also, we have found that there are cross-species in our cross-species mutualisms that are really important. This is also Christine's work. And I just thought it was, it was a tremendous piece of work that really has, has changed ecology in many ways. So she found, she surveyed a lot of these die-off areas. And in the die-off areas, if a grass was without, uh, didn't, didn't have muscles around its roots, it had a 98% chance of dying. With muscles, it had less than a 0.1% of dying. It, it was amazing. So if you see these patches, remnant patches that are left in that mud flat, if you look in them, you're really bound to find um, an aggregation of muscles. And these are rib muscles you see in the top left photo right here. Really cool animals that can withstand 130 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface of a marsh and still filter feed. And they can hole up with that temperature for six hours at low tide, an incredibly resilient muscle. And um, we found in experiments, if you add muscles or pull muscles away, that with muscles, plants uh, grow 100% uh, greater uh, than they do without muscles. And it also, the mechanism we found was that in muscle mounds, muscles do everything. It's like a health spa for the plants. They, they provide nutrients because they're pooping around the Spartina roots. Um, and they reduce salt stress because they, like the mussels in Argentina, uh, hold on to water during low tide. So it's, it's a bit of, and it's also serves as a drain for the rest of the marsh. So all the other water drains through there. And so there's more oxygen as well. So they get more oxygen, less salt, and more nutrients. It's a great, the grass is twice as high in there. And we did some modeling, and this is this cool figure you see on the right. This is led by Christine. And what we looked at were, the 
um, recovery rates of these salt marsh systems with and without mussels. And we see without mussels, as die-off size increases to 2,000 meters squared, without mussels, it can take over 100 years for them to recover. That's not good because extreme drought is coming right now in the southeast every five to 15 years. So that would mean without mussels, this system would be on permanent decline. But with mussels, they recover in 10 years. The reason is, is because these plants don't grow by seeds, they grow by clonal growth. And so those mussels make sure that small little circles of grass are left, which have a high perimeter area ratio. And so those little um, patches are nucleating uh, triggers and devices for um, other plants that, for the ecosystem to recover. So it's disproportionate effect. Next slide, please. The next one we found was really important was an indirect facilitation due to double negative interactions. And this was that blue crabs, by controlling snail numbers, indirectly facilitated Spartina plants. And we have found that in, in areas with low blue crabs, we have high snail densities and grass can be suppressed by 50 to 100%. That snails can actually completely wipe out an area and turn it into a mud flat. We've tested that experimentally. Next slide. And what we found is without predators, if you keep predators out, the snail numbers will increase and they will kill the grass and create mud flats. Without predators, you get one of the most luxuriant ecosystems in the world that can fixed 3,000 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. And this showed us that um, predators are really key to the resilience of this system. It, it, it's, you need predators around and you need mussels around for these ecosystems to recover from salt marshes. Next slide. And so I want to give you some non-salt marshes examples of, of, of what we have um, that shows that these positive interactions are important. And this, this one has to do with sea grasses. This is a paper we did in 2012, and what we in this paper we solved one of the biggest mysteries in marine ecology at the time, and that was how do seagrasses live in the tropics? Um, biogeochemistry and uh, modeling would tell us that they can't live in the tropics for this simple reason: is that it gets so hot there, um, and there's so much dead material in the sediment in the tropics that the sulfide production, that's that rotten egg smell, will be so high that it'll kill the plants. And sulfide is that rotten egg smell is a really nasty compound that um, asphyxiates uh, plants and animals. Um, it cuts down the electron transport chain in our respiration process. So sulfide's bad. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the main point. And what we found was that this clam that associates with seagrasses, especially in the tropics, has a really special bacteria that lives on its gills that likes to eat sulfide. It's pretty amazing. It actually uses sulfide as an energy source to make sugars. And so we found that there was a three or tripartite species interaction. There was a clam, the bacteria on the clam's gills, and then the seagrasses that coupled. And we found that increasing clam density, with increasing clam density, you get increasing sea, seagrass biomass. And we did experiments where we removed these clams in the tropics or in the lab, and the seagrasses greatly decrease in productivity and sometimes die because the sulfide levels increase. So you can imagine that uh, these clams should be very, very important if you want seagrasses to regrow and to uh, stay alive over the long term. Next slide, please. So we, these are, these are Really powerful examples, but you know that's just from our research. So we did the next exercise we did is we went into the literature, and this is a, a meta-analysis approach. It's one of the scientific methods you can use. Um, it's one of the ones we're using right now with uh, COVID. We're putting together what we found from a variety of different studies, and we look at what our generalities across those studies. And what we found is that positive interactions were very abundant in all different types of ecosystems, from deserts to coral reefs to coastal wetlands. It wasn't just salt marshes, rocky intertidal, rivers, streams. They happen in all these ecosystems, and they're really, really powerful. Um, they're really important during ecosystem recovery from disturbance, disturbance especially. Next slide. So because we found that they're, we've shown that they're demonstrated, they're incredibly important for during the recovery of, of coastal wetlands and other ecosystems, and they're common in almost every ecosystem, 
we then begin to write papers in the scientific literature about, wow, th these are great. We need to incorporate these in the restoration practice and design. So we write, you know, with titles, time to cash in on positive interactions for coral restoration. We would say simply that the marine restoration paradigm is based on minimizing competition. We're spacing all these corals out. We're placing the plants out. We're not thinking about whether predators are around to protect them from being grazed down. In the case of seagrasses, we're not putting them with clams. Here are all these examples. And so we'd outline ways for things to change. So we did that for about 10 years. And then we did a literature review to see if anybody was sort of um, reading our papers. And here are the results from that. Next slide. Um, turns out, not many. Uh, only 3% of all studies that we uh, looked at, 626 in our data set, specifically tested for the impacts of incorporating positive species interactions into restoration designs. So it was really interesting. We had spent 15 to 20 years doing the experiments in natural systems and then doing the meta-analysis and writing the how-to papers, but there seemed to be a strong disconnect. And so we, we talked to a couple managers about, they said, oh yeah, we've seen those papers, but there's a risk if we change the way we're doing things. We, sometimes they work when we restore ecosystems, sometimes they don't, but it, there, there's, a, there's a risk if we change things, it could be worse. So the risk averse is the perspective that manager after manager after manager told us. So then we thought, well, um, what would convince them? And they said, well, we really need to see you incorporate the positive interactions in the context of a restoration design. I said, okay, let's do that. Next slide. So let's do our restoration studies. We work with the Boy Scouts here in Tampa Bay and the Girl Scouts. And we also worked with um, scientists and the Nature Conservancy in the Netherlands. And we did a cross-continent cross -continent comparative study where we simply looked at whether or not uh, changing the planting design can change wet, coastal wetland restoration success. And so uh, above, you can see that we have the two treatments. We had dispersed and clumped. And dispersed is the paradigm. The paradigm says you need to plant everything out and then uh, disperse by a meter and don't let the plants touch each other because that will reduce their growth. And then the other one was um, clumped. And you put those neighbors together. And our hypothesis was that would, they would grow better in clumped formations um, rather than in dispersed in that environment. And that actually uh, clumping would be much better in the low intertidal and may be detrimental in the high intertidal where there's less stress. So there, it may switch across stress gradient thought. Next slide, please. So here are the results from that to that experiment. Um, let's talk about the axes first, because there's a lot of stuff here. Um, on the x-axis, that's elevation. And there's two elevations, low and high intertidal. Low intertidal is where it gets flooded more, so that's more stressful. And the y-axis on the, um, the top graphs, that's survivorship of the plugs we put out percent. And then on the graphs below, it's biomass. And then the vertical orientation is on the left-hand side, those two graphs are from Florida. And on the right hand, those are from the Netherlands. And so what you can see here is the black bars are generally much higher than the open bars. And that tells us that uh, clumping has a big effect and that um, can increase the biomass by three to 400% and the survivorship by 100%. And the only uh, exception to that was in the Netherlands, um, if we look down there in relation to biomass. And so you have to, those are the smallest bars. <laughs> so look down there in the lower right-hand corner. And what you'll see there is statistically, there was an interaction. And what that means is that the effect of clumping depended on elevation. In the low elevation, as we predicted, clumping enhanced growth. In high elevation, actually, they did worse clumping. It's better to disperse in that environment. And so what that told us was that our hypothesis was actually correct. Under stressful conditions, plants, neighbors should be together. Under non-stressful conditions, they should be apart. So this, this, this really challenged how coastal wetlands are planted throughout the world. This is mangroves, billion, millions of dollars is being put into this right now, hundreds of millions. Uh, but most of the, in 98% in of the situation, those plantings are dispersed and that clumped. Next slide, please. And so what we did is we worked with managers and I said, they said, well, that, those graphs really don't help us much. We need some, uh, you know, a roadmap for how to map things because there's context dependency. So we put this together with artists. 
And this really explains how planting should change across a physical stress gradient. In the low inner tidal, it should, in mid inner tidal, it should be clumped. In the high inner tidal, it should be dispersed. And this should maximize restoration growth and increase it to, to 300%. Next slide, please. So what about clams? Let's think about seagrasses. So the most obvious thing to do was to try to restore seagrasses with and without clams. And in seagrass restoration success is around 32% around the world. So two thirds of all seagrass restoration projects fail. That means seagrasses just die. And so um, people said it's because of wave stress, um, nutrient stress, because algae overgrows the seagrasses. I'm sure it's the, the case in many situations. So we just wanted to plant them with and without clams. And you can see the difference here. Look, without clams, the seagrasses that we put out slowly just deteriorated. They were kind of wiped by a couple, waves which stressed them out. They, they were being nibbled by herbivores with clams, which add nutrients to their roots and, and in some cases can get rid of sulfites. They were really robust and expanded. Next slide. And here's the data if you don't believe pictures. Um, there was, um, I can't see that even on my phone. Let's see, that is average length increased by 200%. And wow, look at that change in area. There was no change in area and a 400% increase with clams. So what that does is if you incorporate positive interactions, it switches your restoration project from decline or non-success to uh, recovery and a uh, massive success. If this were to expand. Next slide, please. So here's one of seagrass story for seagrass restoration because of predators. This is one of my favorite stories in all of marine ecology at the moment. This was led by Brent Hughes, a postdoc in the Silliman lab for a while. He's a professor at Sonoma State. And this was um, a study he did, and he found that um, in Elkhorn Slough, which I consider almost the toilet bowl on the California coast, uh, the concentration of nutrients there is just massive. It's right in the middle of the breadbasket, and there's all kinds of fertilizer going into this small little slough. And one of the relationships that's sort of rock solid in um, in marine ecology is that with increasing nitrogen and fertilizer going into an ecosystem, we can predictably understand when seagrasses can disappear. And that's that red arrow in that figure. And when the nitrogen loading hits that red arrow, you can look at seagrass coverage goes, drops well below stable to decline, and it gets to about 100% loss pretty fast. And so what we have done for seagrass ecosystems around the world is that we manage to stay below that red line in nutrient loading. And next slide, the nutrient loading in Elkhorn Slough right now is that red dot. So there, you know, there's no way, based on our theory, that you should have seagrasses existing in Elkhorn Slough. I went out there to see this story and I couldn't believe it. These are like the biggest seagrasses I've ever seen. They were five or six feet tall, covered with all kinds of cool organisms and really thriving. And what Brent found out is that they are there because of the recovery of sea otters. It's an amazing story. Sea otters came around the coast and came into this tiny slough and ate almost all the crabs, an invasive crab, small crabs, dungeness crab. And when they ate those crabs, the prey of the crabs exploded. And those happened to be these beautiful green sea slugs. And those sea slugs um, clean the seagrasses. And despite the fact all the nutrients are there and it should fuel algal growth, all these seagrasses have vacuum cleaners, like six or seven vacuum cleaners, natural ones per blade. And those sea slugs are just at the top of the seagrass blades waiting for the next algae to land on the seagrasses. And so the sea otters have really allowed the seagrasses to live beyond this threshold that we thought was like an atomic clock. Next slide. And so um, let's think about these uh, results in the context of how we manage ecosystems. So this isn't restoration, this is managing ecosystems for avoiding a tipping point. There's all kinds of tipping points. NPR talks about tipping points with, with COVID right now. We think about tipping points in the economy. This is a, a nonlinear dynamic where you have an increase in physical stress on the x-axis and on the y-axis you have an amount of something. Uh, number of jobs, uh, health of humans, this is the amount of foundation species. And they are resistant to a point, so there's no change, no change as physical stress increases. But at some point, um, the, the positive species interactions break down, the system breaks down, and it just crumbles. And that's the threshold point. And then it's really hard to recover after that. So what people like to do in this, once we, we understand or, or make predictions about that dynamic, 
is that we want to stay away from that threshold. And that's what we've been doing for seagrasses. But let's, let's, and that's how we manage many ecosystems around the world and manage human health in many ways. Stay away from that threshold so you don't have a nervous breakdown. So from our research, if we overlay that on this conceptual model of how to manage ecosystems, it really changes things. Next slide. So if you look at the mussel Spartina story, we know that mussels allow Spartina to withstand a drought that's twice as intense as we thought it could. So with positive interactions, the threshold of stress that ecosystem can withstand is massive. It's twice of what we would predict if it were just grasses alone in those ecosystems. So if those mussels are harvested, you might want to keep those in the system. But one way of just in this case, what we would do is we would manage to avoid the threshold that we originally thought was there. We would manage to expand um, the threshold. Let's, let's push it out further. Next slide. And if we look at the effect that sea otters can have, it's uh, th that threshold that you see, the small one, that's a real one that we thought exists, and it does exist. In the presence, in the absence of sea otters, that is the threshold at which seagrasses disappear. And um, in the presence of sea otters, we don't know, but I'm predicting it's, it's at least that big of a difference. That has increased it by 700%. And if you look at the economic value of that, if you have to reduce nutrients that much in the Elkhorn Slough, that's tens of millions of dollars, probably $60 million. So those otters are worth a lot to that ecosystem. Next slide. So um, at this point, people are like, that's great. What's my sea otter for kelp forest? What's my sea otter for rainforest? What's my sea otter for salt marshes? And we don't have big predators. They're just not here. Well, that's, uh, we, we published a paper that shows that's simply not true. And what we have found um, is that we put all these aberrant stories that people um, publish in newspapers, not necessarily in publication, peer-reviewed publications, sometimes in publications. And what we found was that there was a general trend that for animals after conservation success, what they, one of the first things they do is they go leave the ecosystem we thought was their favorite one and they go do better in something else. So for instance, alligators, we thought they love freshwater swamps. They actually grow a lot better and do a lot better in marine environments. They eat sharks. Here's a picture of them eating a shark and we've done research on that. They love to eat stingrays and horseshoe crabs. They just go get fresh water on one of the barrier islands and uh, they can deal with salts. Uh, seals and sea lions are coming down to North Carolina in the winter. They've been expanding in New England. And people are like, this is really unusual. That's not the case at all. These marine mammals really occupied the, um, down to the central coast, even further southeast, especially during the winter. Um, big animals can handle a lot of different temperature stress. Whales can go into the tropics in the uh, summertime, actually, the, or the wintertime. Um, large animals can deal with temperature swings. These, the puma are really interesting. They go from Argentina all the way to Canada and we have the Florida panther and everybody thought that was special. Uh, as soon as conservation occurs, they move out and they go into forested ecosystems. Sea otters, we thought they just live in kelp beds and they're specialists. Uh, they move into seagrasses. Why? Uh, it's probably the case that humans had hunted th these uh, animals to near extinction and we, the ecologists started studying them uh, when they were in the refuge habitat, the habitat that gave them the best opportunity to avoid predators. So uh, mountain lions uh, at the tops of mountains. There's the Florida panther, swamp panther and mountain lion are, is just a human artifact. These are really just American lions that could live anywhere. Uh, same with sea otters, river otters, we, they can go out into the ocean as well. So it's probably the case for a lot of these systems. And there's positive interactions available for a lot of different ecosystems now, wolves and marine systems. Next slide, please. So three take home lessons. Hopefully you take from it, positive. I think you can find this in any ecosystem that you wanna work in, um, you, uh, your family, as a scientist, as a volunteer, is that um, positive interactions happen naturally and amplify restoration success. They're in every ecosystem and they're incredibly powerful and they're most important during the recovery and ecosystem. Um, and they can return. So you can imagine we're trying to restore an ecosystem in which rest, positive interactions kept it from falling apart to begin with, but we're planting the animals and the plants out there by themselves. We have to be more complicated approach to that. We have to um, plant them in the presence of their predators. 
So if you're going to restore seagrasses along the California coast and it's polluted, it's, it's very likely you should put sea otters or another predator back there first, like lobsters. Um, to do this, we really need a restoration revolution. And the revolution um, has to be that we have to now systematically incorporate positive interactions. It can't be ad hoc. These can't be cute stories that we say, oh, that's great about Elkhorn Slough, but it, it doesn't happen in my system. What you have to do is challenge the way you think and force yourself to bring in more general uh, ecologists that don't even work in your system that think about these interactions and say, what are we missing? How can we incorporate that? And that needs to expand. Jen Seavey gave me a great example before this talk about how the lobster uh, fishers were benefiting from alewife conservation because that's their primary bait. Um, and there's a benefit there, a positive interaction. How can human managed fisheries, um, people that enjoy the coast, how do they benefit from restoration and how they in turn can they benefit restoration? And so it's, it doesn't stop with just non-human species that humans need to be involved as well. Next slide. And the, um, next slide please. Yeah, last slide. So the restoration revolution also, um, I'm positing and I have a paper coming out on this soon. It, it really needs, we need to, we can use the word restoration, but we need to be forward thinking. The ecosystems that we grew up with, um, won't assemble like that anymore. In Tasmania, for instance, there are were 78 species of fish around Tasmania and Australia about 15, uh, 25 years ago. Now with climate change and the warming of the waters, there were 200 species. And so you can't restore what was there 25 years ago. Things are moving around because of climate change. They now have lobsters. Um, North Carolina, we have stone crabs. We have spiny lobsters that are showing up a lot this year. Things are changing rapidly. And so we need to be adept um, we need to be deft in, in how we think about how we're going to put ecosystems back. In some cases, we're going to put ecosystems back to maximize diversity. Around Manhattan, biodiversity may not be the primary focus and may be a benefit, but we're thinking about services protecting the coast. But this was on the front page of the New York Times a couple of years ago about envisioning a new way to restore ecosystems and not being held back by just saying it's restoration only for biodiversity sake, but it can be for human services to humans, benefits to certain organisms, benefits to fishers, uh, and to help out with the resilience of not only those ecosystems, but the humans that depend on them. And in many cases, it can be biodiversity can be the primary commodity. So we need to think out of the box, not only how we plant, but also how we do things. Okay, that's it. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. I, I think I will forever have embedded in my head, um, mussels are the health spa for salt marsh grass. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, so we have a few questions for you. Uh, Danny is asking, and I believe he's talking about the eelgrass. He says, what was the experiment that indicated that it was oxygen leakage from the roots neighboring grasses that facilitated the growth of the plants and clusters. How did right. you figure that out? Or um, for eelgrass or for salt marsh grass? Mm, he just says grasses, so maybe it's salt marsh grass, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so salt marshes, the experiment was that we planted um, individual plants with and without neighbors, and then we would actually measure um, oxygen availability with a probe called a redox probe. And this is a little um, metal pipe that you stick down in the root layer and you have to let it sit there for a half an hour. And it tells us the potential for electrons to be exchanged, okay, through biochemical processes there. And when oxygen is not around, oxygen is an electron hog, that's why we breathe it in and we use it to break down and release energy. It's very, very uh, strong. And when it's not there, there's a weak, weaker affinity. And so that's how we, we measured that. So we did those experiments. We usually manipulate with and without things. Excellent, thank you. Um, Rachel's asking, when you consider seagrass restoration in the context of clams and restoration as a whole, do you also consider post-microbiome interactions? I know that I've seen some work with seagrass clam microbiome interactions recently and want your take. And while you're thinking about that answer, Rachel, this is for you. It's a gator chomp. <laughs> she says, go gators. 
Awesome. Great question. And absolutely, that's a frontier. And, and we can take a cue from agricultural sciences. There's <laughs> at UF, for instance, you know, there might be um, uh, a couple hundred soil scientists looking at the microbiome uh, for corn and orange or whatever it is. And we need to do that. And I imagine there's going to be a massive bump. Uh, for instance, we know that salt marsh plants uh, need mycorrhizal fungi in their roots to do really well. And they, that only happens when there's holes in the grounds created by the crabs. So we, we, we don't have that when we restore ecosystems. Um, so do we outplant crabs or do we pull out the holes themselves? But I think the microbiome is this massive frontier. And if we can manipulate that at scale, Australians are thinking about this with coral right now. So if you wanna know the cutting edge stuff, I would go to Australia because they are industrializing this stuff. They, they, are, they have massive like tankers, Chinese tankers, they're collecting coral larvae and seeing if they can spread it over degraded reefs. And my, my comment on that is like, that's a great, but what are they gonna hit? They need to hit a reef with a few other live, live corals because those corals submit cues. They protect them from predators. We need herbivores on that reef. So you can actually set up you know, house, set up the house before you put the babies there. That's kind of like with all the positive interaction. But the microbiome is key. In addition to uh, going to Australia, what would you say to Alexander on advice that you would give someone looking to go into a career in marine conservation and restoration? Um, well, I've, or here I'll give you advice. So it's a different research track. You, you really need to become and do science and practice science in the ecosystem in which you want to conserve. So if you want to be a marine ecologist, it doesn't matter the habitat you're studying. But if you want to be a coral reef conservationist or coastal wetland, you need to think about that habitat first. And then think about uh, what are the goals there and how can you use basic ecological theory that people have learned about how systems are organized, what controls diversity, how do ecosystems recover from like terrestrial rainforest. Don't read about the ecosystem you want to protect first. Read about other ecosystems in which they have protected them effectively and which they can grow them back effectively, even if you read agricultural literature, and then spend a month doing that and then jump back in to see, and you're like, wow, these people in salt marshes are in the uh, Middle Ages. But if you start with salt marsh, you'll be like, boy, they've done it all. <laughs> yeah. That's a great point. Um, Jim's asking a really interesting question here. On your study of primarily clonal plant, plants, how important is the genetics to the success? Oh, we have totally ignored that. And um, uh, Randall Hughes has done some really nice work, I would say, with, you know, with, with, with Spartina and also with eelgrass to show that, you know, there's differences I showed with and without muscles she's been able to show, um, she's at Northeastern University, a professor there, you can get that sort of difference with different genotypes. Some of those genotypes do really well in the presence of herbivorous geese. Um, and I imagine the genetics is really, really important. Steve Palumbi is working with that right now with corals, for instance, a lot of people are. So that's another component, which one of these genotypes, and that should be layered in as well. Um. Okay, I'm not totally understanding this question, but I'm gonna ask you, Ingrid, you might, you might need a little more help from you. Um, when studying the positive effects of neighbors with grasses, did you consider the impact on drag reduction? Oh, do you mean by the yeah. water? Oh, That's great. How does that aid in increased survivability? Yeah, I get That's it. That's great, great insight. Uh, that actually was the mechanism by which um, plants, um, positively uh, benefited each other in the Netherlands. So I couldn't go into the detail, but in Florida, it was through oxygen reduction in the low zone, but in the Netherlands, it was sandy. There was oxygen getting down to their roots, but it was the water just moved fast there and there's lots of waves. So it was actually the plants in the middle did not get eroded and, the, and they grew big enough to withstand it. And the ones on the outside were taking the blunt of it. So, and I think that's probably gonna be one of the most important things about clumping these organisms is that they, um, they, they can withstand higher uh, wave forces. Deamy Stewart says hi to you and says a great talk. 
do you think, and asks, do you think the conservation of restoration should shift towards intervention ecology, where we use history as a guide to restore ecosystems to levels that are achievable today? It's a good question. So um, intervention is, um, you know, that's the word that, it's, a, it's conservation action. So I think we're, we're doing that. And I think restoration, you're right, needs to become an intervention tool that uh, people consider as a legitimate offer, um, option. Right now, we're not people are questioning whether or not we should invest in restoration because it fails a lot. And she's exactly right. So I think we have to get better at it and show that we can get better. It's basically in its infancy. It's think about agricultural science. And we can, we can double. We can double. We add genetics. We add microbiome. We clump. We have predators there. There's these, the growth rates are, can really expand right now. And so I think that's, that's critically important is showing that they can do that. What was the second part of that question? Uh, I was just about, uh, sorry. Well, do you think we should use this intervention ecology and in using history as the guide? Yeah, so history, that's up to um, the people who get to decide. I think history, as I was ending, history can be one guide, but really we have to use forecasting because history, we can't even get back there in many cases. Yeah. Um, and the species are gonna be different. Corals are showing up. Sydney Harbor, I snorkeled with corals and kelp forest right next to each other. <laughs> Mangroves are expanding. And so at the same time, we can, we can really uh, affect coastlines. And so history can inform it, but it can't be as it has been in the past the only um, uh, mechanism, the, the only pathway for information to come. Yeah, think about the oyster work that we did in Florida. We were doing it to a, to a uh, sea level rise model because we, exactly. knew we weren't gonna have the same sea level and the same fresh water supply in the future. So we were restoring to the future, really. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for you, which is, there is so much money and business in um, freshwater wetland mitigation and restoration. Have you seen any of this work applied there, the spe positive species interaction work? Um, I would say a little bit with clumping. They, they've used, so in some freshwater wetlands, there are these hummocks, and that people know that those hummocks are critically important. They, they, so you can plant species in the hummocks, so they will mimic those. And really, that gets to a good point. Um, how do we, there are certain traits of organisms that create positive interactions. Like for the Spartina plants, it's their stems that are really important. For the seagrasses, it's the roots. The roots stabilize. And so we have a paper coming out making the argument that we need to figure out what these traits are and then um, mimic those. And that's what they do in wetlands, in, in freshwater wetlands, and mimic those traits with bioengineered structures that are biodegradable. So we want to make root-like structures that will biodegrade. And then you can just use one little plug of seagrass that's protected in its roots with simulated roots that degrade. So that's what we hope because we don't have enough babies. <laughs> you know, we don't have enough baby seagrasses, baby corals to get around. So we have to make sure that the babies that we do put out really grow really fast. Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, it's about 8.30, so we're gonna end here. All of these talks are on the Shoals live stream page, everyone. It's at the shoalsbrainlaboratory.org website. So please feel free to share that or go back to it if you wanna revisit some of the things that Brian said tonight. Our next talk is next Tuesday. Um, Doug Rasher is a senior research scientist for the Center for Ocean Health at Bigelow. It's in a few hours north in Maine. And he's gonna be discussing something actually quite related to this. He's gonna be looking at the loss of a keystone predator and climate change and how those together are reshaping Alaska's kelp forests. So Brian, you might wanna tune into that one. That sounds good. <laughs> Um, so all of our information about events this summer and all of the talks are on the ShoalsMarineLaboratory.org page. And if you're liking what you see and want to support us, you can definitely make a donation there as well. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian, so much for that great talk. Appreciate it. Great to see you. And everyone take care and see you here again soon. Good night. <laughs>
Good night, Brian. Thank you.